Um, good afternoon, everybody. So um, I'm going to be talking about using cost-effectiveness analysis to um, inform decisions about which policies to fund, which health interventions and which health policies. And what this entails is um, estimating how much that policy improves health and then asking whether the resources required to implement that policy could have generated better health gains if used in other ways. Um, in economics, we refer to this as the opportunity cost. There's a cost to investing in a particular health policy because we forego these benefits that we could have obtained from investing the same resources in different ways. Now, the cost effectiveness analyses that are typically used to inform funding decisions around healthcare interventions, for example, by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, typically focus on how policies impact on population health on average. But the issue is that and in interventions that impact on um, overall population health don't all have the same kind of impact on health inequality. So what I've shown here is three different interventions that all improve population health by the same amount, but the, where those health benefits fall in the population is, differs in terms of whether it accrues to disadvantaged groups or advantage groups. Now, some interventions we know can increase health inequalities, and this might be because they work better in more advantage groups or because they're used more by more advantage groups. And for example, um, some smoking cessation services have been found to have that quality. If you offer um, counselling and pharmacotherapies, you find that the amount by which they improve the likelihood that you quit um, is much higher in more advantaged groups compared to disadvantaged groups. And actually, those services are used to a greater degree by more advantaged groups. Other interventions do benefit uh, disadvantaged groups, um, but they do so by a lesser degree compared to other things we could have invested that money in. And so, on, on net terms, they don't improve health inequality. Because policymakers aren't provided with information about who gains and who loses, from the alternative um, policies they could choose between, they can't base their choice on impacts on health inequality. So what we did in the Center for Health Economics was to develop a framework for distributional cost effectiveness analysis to try and give policymakers information about the gainers and the losers from the different um, policy options. And that allows them to base their decision not only on how um, the policies would change overall health, but also on how it changes health inequality. And one way we can show this is on the health equity impact plane. So we can show whether or not it improves health or not on the, on the vertical axis in this graph, and we can show whether or not it reduces inequality or increases inequality on the x-axis. And this might enable you to prioritise between different interventions um, based on their health inequality impacts as well. And um, the aim is to get uh, information about health inequalities to impact on funding decisions. So these type of methods could be used wherever there is current use of cost effectiveness analysis to inform funding decisions. For example, it might be used in impact evaluations um, by the Department of Health and Social Care. It might be used in their arm's length bodies, such as the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence or um, Public Health England, or it might be used um, at a local level by clinical commissioning groups and local authorities. And the idea is that um, if we provide this additional information, not only on how policies impact on overall health, but the distribution of health, that we might improve the ability and the efficiency um, of efforts to uh, reduce health inequalities in the population. But what do we need for this to work? Well, we need some kind of agreement on what are the relevant health inequalities for us to evaluate and to target. So we need some specification of what health inequalities are regarded as unfair, and that should be um, the focus of our um, investment activities. And obviously, this is a very contentious issue. People disagree as to which health inequalities might be regarded as unfair. But there are some broad level agreements and some policy goals stated um, in relation to this. For example, in the Health and Social Care Act or in the NICE uh, quality objectives focusing on um, inequalities in life expectancy um, associated with socioeconomic factors. This um, decision, the social value about which health inequalities to focus on needs to be coming from the decision makers um, and based on social values and not imposed by us as uh, analysts 
in the choices we make. Um, where we don't identify a dominant health policy, so if we don't find that one of the policy options available to us increases health by the most uh, amount and also reduces inequality by the most amount, we'll be in a situation where we have to make a trade-off. We have to choose between one policy that might improve health by the greatest amount but not reduce health inequality by the greatest amount and an alternative that would give us better improvement in health inequality but not as much um, population health. So what we need there is some social value attached uh, to that trade off to reductions in health inequality compared to increases in overall population health. We need to know how much um, people would be willing to forego increases in population health in order to reduce that health inequality. And you can elicit these values from the, from the general population to inform these types of analysis. As I mentioned, we're in, um, interested in the opportunity cost. So we're interested um, not only in how much health um, we forego by not investing in other activities, but in where that health would have fallen if we'd used those other activities, the distribution of this health opportunity cost. Um, um, we also can refer to this as the distribution of the, of the marginal product of public health resources that might be the NHS funds, it might be local authority budgets or, or other um, investment opportunities. When we're applying these methods, uh, we need to also take into account uh, the constraints of the decision-making process, so how much time and resource are available to conduct these type of analyses. Um, the type of analysis that you might be able to do to inform someone like the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence might be very different to the type that might be uh, reasonable to inform decisions within a local authority because of the scope of the resources available. And so we have a choice between the kind of level and granularity of detail to which we do this analysis. We've got a more aggregate or simplified approach that we developed that gives you cruder information on health inequality impact but is much less resource intensive. And then there's the, the fuller um, approach which requires modelling these uh, different policies to a greater degree of detail, which gives you a more accurate answer, but might actually not be practical for some decision-making contexts. We also rely on evidence on how um, um, things vary between equity-relevant groups of the kind that Rachel had just talked about um, synthesising earlier, so these types of studies. So in terms of how we've worked with uh, stakeholders and partners to develop this methodology, it began um, through the policy research programme funded by the Department of Health uh, and Social Care um, in, as part of the Public Health Research Consortium, of which the University of York is a member alongside um, some other universities and some charities as well. So we had funding under the, the Public Health Research Consortium, which enables us to partner and work with people from a range of different disciplines, not only health economists, but also people with expertise in public health, in marketing, in survey and evaluation. And this is important to us because obviously there's a great field of research in health inequalities and we can um, uh, rely on that expertise and also uh, present and consider the development of this framework in partnership with those other experts. Through that collaboration with the Public Health Research Consortium, we were able to partner uh, with other universities. So we did some work with the University of Sheffield um, that allowed us to look uh, to apply this framework to look at um, the impact of alternative bowel cancer screening policies on health inequalities and overall health, and um, in terms of alcohol and screening and brief interventions against uh, alcohol. And we've combined that with work that we've done here on smoking cessation, working with those. Um, through the policy uh, research programme um, under the Economic Evaluation Policy Research Unit that we're a member of, uh, we uh, had a PhD studentship that enabled us to develop some of the fundamental inputs we require to undertake some of these analyses. So we um, were able to look at what is the socioeconomic distribution of healthy life expectancy in the UK. So that's the kind of starting point um, uh, from which we're comparing the imposition of these alternative policies. And we were also able to look at the distribution of the health opportunity cost of NHS funds. So what we found that if you uh, increase expenditure in the NHS, that gives you um, an, an increase in health uh, outcomes in the population. And that benefits the most disadvantaged groups by almost twice as much as the most advantaged groups. So you get this reduction in health inequality from expanding existing NHS type activities. This is very important for us for determining whether a, a new policy would uh, re reduce health inequality because it needs to benefit disadvantaged groups by more than those 
alternative activities to have a net reduction in health inequality. Um, subsequent to the work that we did with the Public Health Research Consortium, we um, did, partnered with the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence because they were very interested to learn how they could incorporate health inequality impacts more in their decision-making process. And so um, we uh, were able to uh, work with them alongside an update to a guideline on smoking cessation services. And this was important. It gave us access to the precise model they were using to inform the decision in that particular uh, case in um, uh, point and that was developed by the York Health Economics Consortium uh, here and what we showed was how you could adapt that model and use it to evaluate the impact on health inequalities as well within the constraints of the particular NICE public health guideline decision making process. For, with NICE we also did this more simple approach and we looked across all of the public health guidelines um, to see if we could give information about how from a more simplified approach about how each of those might be impacting on health inequality in the distribution. And there's further in interest and discussions ongoing with NICE about how we might introduce this more into their decision-making process. This gives us a nice pathway um, to impact of knowing how the methods that we develop might actually impact on treatment choices, policy choices that impact on patients' health outcomes. Um, there's other work that's ongoing in the Centre for Health Economics, funded by uh, the GCRF, where we're applying these type of messages, uh, methods outside of the UK. So, for example, we're working um, in Malawi at the moment, and that's a very different context where you have different um, challenges in terms of the data that are available. Uh, there's no vital registration system, so we don't know much about um, life expectancy and mortality, let alone across different um, socioeconomic groups in Malawi and um, there's less information av available about usage of health services, for example. But nevertheless, we're scoping um, what data are available from surveys and other things that would allow us to use these methods, for example, to inform which types of interventions you would uh, include in a health benefits package on your move towards universal um, health co coverage. And we've also um, got some experience now of working, um, involving members of the public and, and patients um, it, with these uh, methods, particularly when we're um, applying for new research funding and we're relying on the advice of, of patients and public in designing that research, in prioritising what questions we look at, and also in how we communicate and the language we use to discuss these ideas to make clear um, what's at stake. So some of the challenges that we face so far, obviously considering uh, health inequalities and which ones are unfair is a highly contentious issue. And the stakeholders that we work with are not all going to agree. Um, and there's not going to be a, a consensus necessarily about what are um, the, the relevant health inequalities to focus on, nor about the particular values that we should um, apply to those health inequalities. But the framework we designed um, was specifically um, uh, intended to be flexible and to demonstrate the impact of alternative reasonable social value judgments on what you would conclude about prioritising these alternative policies. So we've tried to address this challenge and um, recognise it in, in the way, in the method that we've developed. In explaining the method to people, we've um, t used applications to demonstrate how it works. But the challenge there is that sometimes the choices um, that you make in a particular application uh, to demonstrate the method, people take that as a prescription of what you should do when you apply the same method the next time. So you kind of lose some of that flexibility when you're communicating this thing um, uh, in, through applications. So some people have read the bowel cancer screening application that we did and took that as an example of how you would have to do this in all other cases. Um, but the types of inequalities and the types of issues that are important when you're looking at alternative tests for bowel cancer screening don't necessarily translate to very different types of, of health intervention. So um, in part to address this, we're developing a range of different applications. This helps uh, shows, show how flexible the approach can be and look at a range of alternatives. We've also faced a lot of challenges with availability of data. We um, are interested in information that allows us to determine how intervention uptake differs between social groups, how the efficacy of interventions differs between social groups, how their usage of existing services dif differs. And sometimes we completely lack this type of information. In its absence, we can try and use sensitivity analysis within our models to show how
how important it is. And at the same time, we can try and generate uh, information on this. So, for example, with that PhD studentship, we were able to generate the type of information we require on the distribution of the health opportunity cost from NHS funds. Um, but what we do still need to do is to extend that because we're not only interested in looking at informing decisions that impact on NHS funds, but also local authorities and, and other collective uh, resources. Um, so I'll just finish up with some learning that we uh, have so far from the development of this methods. Um, we've been working on the through the policy research program, and what this means is that people at Department of Health and Social Care um, review our, our research questions and help us prioritise. And it, what it means is that we're focusing on questions that are a relevant concern to, to policymakers. Our work with the Public Health Research Consortium um, helps us partner with people with it from a range of expertise that have studied health inequalities um, from a range of different disciplines. This is important when we're communicating our methods and talking about it because sometimes we use uh, the diff different terms to refer to the same thing and we can be talking around each other um, unless we come to a common understanding of, of the language that we're using. Um, our work with the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence means that um, the type of methods that we're uh, designing that we're hoping will bring health inequality impacts into better consideration in funding decisions are designed to take account of the particular constraints of that decision-making process, so how much time is available, the resources available that are norm normally committed to the cost-effectiveness analysis to inform those decisions. Um, we've presented results to a range of different audiences now. Um, we've been invited to give talks at the Department of Health to NICE analysts uh, for Public Health England and, and broadcast to local authorities at academic conferences and in international audiences. And obviously then we um, are getting practice then at trying to communicate the methods to a range of different audiences and trying to communicate in the most simple terms, but um, w reflecting the, the complexities that can uh, rise in this field of um, research. We've applied it to different health systems, which has uh, challenges in terms of uh, what are the relevant equity concerns, but also the data availability. We find that explaining these kind of things with applied examples can really help in overcoming those differences in languages, because you can clearly illustrate what you're talking with, uh, talking about with results as well as trying to just describe them. And it helps to show as well as tell about these methods to give confidence that it really is a practical tool that can be used. And so we think that working with decision makers, if you show it can be done, um, rather than just say that they should start using it, that, that would uh, need more to impact. Through the course of this, we've developed teaching tools um, and we've made them available freely online. And we found that this is actually very helpful to us in having conversations with people about how the methods work to enable them to actually go and access those tools and have a practice and play around with some of these things, particularly some of the um, more uh, concepts around how we actually measure and value health inequalities. So that's a, a valuable approach, we would say, in uh, promoting these methods more widely.